Our next speaker is among a cohort of speakers who in the 1990s literally, literally made plain the message of Islam for an entire generation of young Muslims, not only in America, but around the world. A father of five sons, an author, a scholar, a visionary who founded Zaytuna Institute and then went on most recently to found America's first liberal arts college co-founded along with Imam Zaid Shakir and Dr. Hatem Bazian. Brothers and sisters, give a warm, warm Isna welcome and a welcome back to our teacher and mentor, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Allahumma iftah alayna hikmatak wa anshur alayna rahmatak ya adha al-jalali wa al-ikram. Wa salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi al-kiram wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. First of all, I want to say that when I was a, a young man, I, I met Isna. And I was actually a little older than Isna. I was in my early 30s. Isna was around 30. And I, I, I basically ended up in an arranged marriage. It's been 20 years. And marriages are interesting, aren't they? Because it's nasib. But the person that arranged that marriage was one of the founders of Isna, Dr. Mahbub Khan. Allah yarahamuhu. And Dr. Mahboob, I was an Imam Khatib in California. And a little bit of a firebrand and what you would call a loose cannon. So Dr. Mahmoud, converts, there's a convert syndrome. Because converts enter into a very dangerous period after they convert. They get very enthusiastic. And so... Dr. Mahbub Khan, he said to me, I want you to speak at Isna. And he said, even though I don't agree with everything you say, I think you're good for the American Muslim community. That was his view. Because Dr. Mahbub Khan was a visionary. He was somebody that didn't allow ideological differences or those types of differences of, of methodology if they weren't substantial. Because in the end of the day, if we share the creed of Islam and we believe in the rightly guided scholars and imams of Islam, those differences of methodology are all open to debate. And so, in honor of him, I wanted to mention him. And I remember Dr. Sayyid, Sayyid also trying to calm me down a few times. So, in the spirit of being a loose cannon, and also, I really want to say this in all honesty, I hope this is my last Saturday night address because I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm very honored that Isna has brought me back and, and I felt so much love from the community, but I really feel that other people should be up here. We have some really, really good young scholars that are up and coming. And I want to see them uh, begin to take over these positions. I'm, I'm working on establishing a college in California. So having said that, I want to say that I've always felt an immense amount of love from people here, from the Muslim community. There's always the haters. It's just the way it is. There's the enviers, the haters and then the petty people. Those people always exist in every time and every place. And, you, and you, if you're going to be in a, in a public position, you cannot take them seriously. 
you just have to do what you believe and let the cards fall where they fall and have a thick skin about those things. But what I want to talk about, I was asked to talk about a moral vision for this country. And, and I want to preface that by saying a moral vision for the future to me is a moral vision from the past. I truly believe that the moral issues of every time and place are basically the same issues. Our Prophet ﷺ, and as far as I can tell, he is the first human being in human history to articulate the principle of human equality, that all people are created equal. Long before the Declaration of Independence said, all men are created equal, our Prophet ﷺ said, there's no difference between a black man or a white man, or a white man or a black man. The only difference is in their God consciousness. And I know of no previous historical statement I have never seen that in the Bible. I've never seen that in any philosopher before the prophet. Aristotle talked about natural slaves with all his genius and brilliance. But our prophet Sallallahu articulated this to remove racism. As far as I can tell, the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is the first human being to articulate the equality of men and women. I've never found anybody in the history of, of humanity before him to ever articulate that men and women are essentially the same. Before their Lord, they are both spiritual beings with the same rights. There's some variance in their responsibilities based on fitra, on the primordial nature, but they're equal. The Prophet ﷺ was also, as far as I can tell, the first person to legislate from these religions, clearly, economic justice in all of the strata of society, not for one group or for one set of believers, but for all of the people. The Prophet ﷺ in his final speech, and I've mentioned it here before, you will see all of those major issues that are affecting human beings. My deep concern about this country is that America, and we as a people, and I speak as we, we are all, I'm an American, I can speak as an American. And when I'm speaking as an American, my Islam here is incidental. In the same way that many, many people in this country have spoken up about things they find troubling in their country, from the Jewish community, from the Christian community, from the atheist secular community. There are things in this country that I find deeply disturbing. Arnold Toynbee said that societies don't commit, they don't, they're never murdered. Civilizations are not murdered. The great English historian, he said civilizations commit suicide. And as far as I can tell, and I actually did a rotation in a psychiatric unit and had some suicidal patients. As far as I can tell, I see very serious suicidal tendencies in this society. There are things that are deeply troubling about this society. The mechanization of warfare, the idea that you can send robots to eliminate people on other parts of the planet, that you can have civilians or people living normal lives in suburbia, in New York, and they go to work, and their work is to drop bombs on people on the other side of the planet. And when they talk about their successful strikes, they say three suspected terrorists were killed in a drone strike today. Three suspected terrorists. And we know for a fact that innocent people have died in these strikes. Many children, by their own estimates, over 200 children in northern Pakistan have died from these drone strikes terrorizing people living in these places. This troubles me about this country. It troubles me because I live here. I pay my taxes, but it troubles me and it troubles me deeply. And I really feel that we, we as, as Muslims need to be courageous. It's, it's difficult to be courageous. We're living in a society that doesn't encourage people to speak up, even whistleblowers. If you look at some of the problems 
that these whistleblowers who have spoken about wrongdoings in corporations or in the government, what happens to them and how they're actually, they suffer from speaking based on their moral consciousness. If we look at recently what, what happened in this situation with all of these leaks and how this person was treated and all of these people that have had the moral courage, those people that released the pictures from Abu Ghraib, do you remember Abu Ghraib? Iraq now is suffering more than it's ever suffered. It's worse than, than during even the war period. It's a country in complete dissolution. Palestine, these are real problems, human problems that our country should not participate in creating more problems, but with the gifts that we've been given as a country, the power that we've been given at this country, we should be part of the solution and not part of the problem, really. And we as a community have to be a moral conscience. We have to speak the truth. As a community, we also have to look at the type of culture that we are spreading around the globe. We are the number one producer of pornography in the world. This is deeply troubling to me as somebody who's trying to raise young boys. Adolescents are always mystified by sexuality. They're mystified by it. But what we're dealing with now on the internet is so deeply troubling. We recently had a courageous owner of hotels in Sweden who began to work on the problem of human trafficking and when he realized the connection between pornography and human trafficking, he removed pornography from his hotels. This is something that should be honored, it should be news. The country of Iceland that prohibits pornography the sale of pornography in Iceland, not because they're religious people, it's one of the most secular countries in the world, but, but, but because they're a middle class people and they know that pornography is harmful for the common weal. But what's worse is that pornography is no longer X-rated. We have in the Video Music Awards a young girl who had millions and millions of followers as Hannah Montana. Millions of young American girls that saw her as something to be emulated, to be looked up at. And in a display of utter degradation, human degradation, to a male or a female. And I don't blame Miley Cyrus. I see her as a victim of a dem demonic, dehumanizing, entertainment culture. In fact, I would call it an a culture, not a culture, because of the uh, occultic undertones in it. It's a dark culture, and this is what our mainstream entertainment is producing. So all of those children that saw her in the Mickey Mouse Club as a young and innocent girl are now twerking a word that shouldn't even be in our vocabulary. This troubles me about this country. And I think Muslims, as one of the last bastions of really serious commitment to modesty, to honoring our women, may Allah reward all of you, all of these women, incredible courage in the midst of a naked society a society that removes clothes, that these women go out every day in their jobs, working amidst people who see it as some kind of backward, retrograde approach to women. And yet we have social science that has shown that when men see a naked woman or a woman in a bathing suit, the same area of the brain that lights up when they see a tool, lights up. It's not the frontal lobe. It's a complete objectification that occurs. This is what happens to our women when they become objects of lust, as opposed to human beings with minds, with spirits, with something to say, not to be used and abused and then thrown away. And look how many women we have out here 
that are raising their children in single homes because they had children out of wedlock. There was no commitment by the male to a family. And they suffer and they struggle. Some of them are on welfare and they're fortunate to live in a country where they can get some help. This is a crisis in our country. We also have a culture that will not talk about sexually transmitted diseases in any honest way. Every single thing that is harmful for you in America, they'll warn you about. If donut, they'll warn you about donuts. They'll have commercials about fatty foods. Everybody knows potato chips are not good for them. Everybody knows that French fries aren't good for them. They know that cheesecake's not good for them. But nobody will dare speak out against the deviant sexual practices that occur in this country and are not only not talked about, are promoted by mainstream entertainment and society. Promoted deviant sexual practices that are harmful to the human being. Pathogenic sexual practices that cause serious diseases. This isn't like a fatty food that takes time, many years, before it accumulates and causes a heart attack. This is a one-time possible death sentence. And yet people won't speak honestly about it. The World Health Organization tells us that rectal intercourse is the most risky form of sexual behavior. That's what the World Health Organization has to say, and yet people will not say this is not a healthy choice. I don't want my child to be practicing this, male or female. This has nothing to do with sexual preference. This has to do with a sexual practice that is done amongst heterosexual people and amongst homosexual people. Yet it's harmful and nobody wants to speak about it. We need our physicians to speak up about the types of cancers that occur, about what happens when you get genital warts. I worked for a gastroenterologist and saw firsthand what happens to people. Nobody wants to talk about this. And yet we have a society now where they say just get a vaccination for HPV as if this is some normal event that's going to happen in your life. You're just going to get HPV. No, there are many strains of HPV, but sexually transmitted HPV is a very specific type that is transmitted through sexual practices when people are having multiple partners or practicing types of sexual behavior that are unacceptable. This is the reality of our culture. We need to, we need to have honesty amongst our physicians. People need to speak out. They can't be afraid of a culture that is promoting pathogenic forms of behavior. Recently at the Pride, Gay Pride Parade in New York, they requested that they all get meningitis shots because there's a new strain of meningitis in the homosexual community that is extremely deadly and it has only shown up in that community. It is not fair to people with same-sex urges not to tell them about the dangers of this lifestyle. It's not fair. For young people, all people can make their decisions, but a 15-year-old kid in high school, he deserves to know the nature of these practices. We also have to recognize that we have a society, the economic injustices in this society are immense. If people want to understand what happened in the Muslim world recently, you have to understand the collapse of the economic system in this country. When all of the real estate collapsed, where did the money go? It went into commodities. What happened in the Muslim countries? All of the food stocks went up. People, suddenly people who they were paying 25% of their salary to food were now paying 45 to 50% and they didn't have money to pay their rent. They didn't have money for other things. It created an immense amount of strain on these societies. And so people were becoming so frustrated. If we remember how it all started, it started over an economic crisis in Tunis. Do people remember that? It started over a man who was trying to earn a livelihood by selling things. This is a crisis. We have an economic crisis. Nobody talks about the Greek meltdown. We have all these people attacking Turkey, but the reality of Turkey, the reality of Turkey is Turkey has only recently paid off completely their IMF debt. 
Turkey is one of the only debt-free countries on this planet. And why isn't that in the news? Why is Erdogan being demonized as a tyrant when he has shown incredible fiscal responsibility for his country with immense growth? And now we're going to see constraints put on Turkey. You will see from outside. And Turkey is going to get hit economically. You'll see this in the future. Why? Because there are entities on this planet that do not want to see a successful Muslim model. And Turkey is an extraordinary country with a great people. They have proven that Muslims and seculars can live side by side. They have proven this. We had today, you see people say, oh, the Palestinians and Jews, they could never live together. They lived together for over a thousand years. It's a lie. I was walking with my friends today and I saw Rabbi Weiss, who, from, who came from New York, he had his little Palestinian scarf. He had the enormous hat, which I don't know what they call them. But when I saw him, I felt happy. And I looked at them and I said, oh, look, here's this, this, Palis this uh, Jewish man from New York who is against the oppression, the Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people. And he gave me a hug, and I hugged him, and then we parted, and then he came back just to say, please, mention that there are Jews against what's happening in Palestine. Tell them that. Tell the Muslims that. He has come here consistently to be in solidarity with Muslims from the Jewish tradition. Minhum and mu'minun. Allah says amongst them are, there are good people amongst them. And we know that. And we shouldn't demonize the Jews just like we don't like to be demonized. There are good people amongst, we have natural allies amongst many of the Christians. Unfortunately, we need to disabuse them of their attitudes about Islam because they have been brainwashed over a long period of time and then we have too many people in the Muslim world creating so much commotion. There's a lot of instability, but Muslims have been driven mad by social conditions. People talk about human nature. I just want to say this. If you take animals and you put them in, in cages, in inhumane conditions, they don't behave like they would in their natural habitat. They begin to tear each other apart. They begin to fight each other. This is what happens. This is my swan song, so I might not pay attention to those little things she's holding up. They might not, they, might, they don't behave like they would in a natural environment. They start to kill each other. Human be I lived with human beings. I lived with Bedouin. I spent seven years with Bedouin, living in different places with them. I lived with them and I saw how they interact, how they love each other. I saw how a human being behaves when he's allowed to be human. When you look in the ghettos and say, look at these animals. They're not animals, they're human beings that have been put in inhumane environments. And if you change their environments, you will change their behavior. Really, you will change their behavior. They're human beings. And, and, I, and really, it, it would break if, if Dr. King, if Malcolm X could come back and see what's happened in many of these communities, the degradation, the social disintegration. If they could see it, they would weep tears of blood. I believe that. I really believe that. They would weep tears of blood to see and look at the successful Muslims, the successful African Americans in Hollywood that are degrading themselves. Women that were stripped, their ancestors were stripped of their clothes and now they're paid to strip their clothes. No, they should be honor themselves. They've been given the privilege of honoring themselves in a society that will allow that now. These, these are the things that trouble me about this culture and Muslims should be a spark of hope. We should be a beacon of light, not just for people overseas, but for people in this country. When they see the dignity of our dress, when they see the dignity of our behavior, when they see the excellence of our schools, when they see the professionalism of our doctors, of our healers, of our lawyers, when they see people that are ethical at the root and the core and they won't inform they won't absolve themselves of those ethical responsibilities, then we'll be a beacon of light. And people will say, I want to be like those people, like that man 
We had a man in a <coughs> in a 7-Eleven store, and a man came in with a pipe <coughs> trying to steal money from him. And he said to him, he took out a gun. He had a gun. He pulled out the gun, and the man stopped. He dropped the gun. And he said, I'm so sorry. I'm just desperate. I don't have any food. That Muslim man gave him $20. $40 and made him promise that he wouldn't steal again. And then the man said, this is, this is, this is something that you can see because it was filmed. Bismillah. That man who was robbing that man said, I want to be a Muslim. And he said the Shahada right there and then. That's like something you read in the books. <clears throat> because he treated him like a human being. Too many people are denigrated in this culture. We have now a culture that's emerging where people live in these bubbles and then other people live in another world, where SWAT teams invade their homes on a daily basis, where their children are taken away from them because of these protective services and they don't have the lawyers that can prevent that from happening. Really, there are two Americas that have emerged, the VIP America and the poor America. The middle class has eroded immensely. Now you can, if you have money, you can drive in the fast lane. It didn't used to be like that in America. Now if you go to Disneyland or any of these amusement parks, you have fast tracks. Because if you have money, you don't have to wait in line with the peons. This is different from the ideal that was America. So we have a lot of work to do. And finally, in conclusion, I want to say to all of you, I've heard a lot of Muslims lately say, I'm so depressed. I was in recently in Arabia, and I have a Muslim friend. He was a very active Muslim. And I said, what, what are you doing these days? He said, no, I'm, I just, I, I, I've given up. That's what he said to me. He said, I've given up. I'm, I'm, I've had enough. You know, there's no hope. I grabbed him and I shook him, literally, physically. And people who know me know that I'm very capable of doing that. I shook him and I said to him, what do you mean there's no hope? If you want a bid'ah, hopelessness is a bid'ah. We are a religion of hope. We live on hope. Every time you're depressed or you say there's no hope, what you're saying to every African that was brought over in chains, and, and survived the transatlantic crossing and came here and lived in slavery and marched to get their civil rights, you're saying to them, that was all a waste of time. If you're depressed, you're dishonoring all those Andalusians who were chased out of what was called paradise at the time. <coughs> they were chased out of Andalusia, but they made new lives for themselves in Tunisia, in Morocco, and today you have Andalusian families that hail from Andalusia, just like you have Palestinians here that were chased out of their homes. You're dishonoring all of those Indians that migrated to Pakistan with the hope of a better life. You're dishonoring the Afghanis that have lived in over 30 years of war, and they're still trying to hold their heads high. <coughs> we can't do that. There's no room for hope. I'm in it till the last breath. I'm in it till the last breath. Because in that last breath, and I pray to God that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me on my last breath, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad rasulullah, because I believe in the promise of God. I believe that his prophet was true. I believe that hell is true and that the fire is true and that the day of judgment is true. And I testify to the truth of the sirat that we will be weighed in the balance and there will be those who are found wanting and there will be those who are given grace and there will be the outstrippers. These are all true things that every prophet has taught and I believe in them and I will hold to them till I die and the struggle continues. This world was never meant to be paradise. God has created a world that is meant to drive you to God and if you're been, be, being driven to the devil, you've been duped, my friends, because all of the hardships that you suffer in your life, if you believe in God, you will find those rewards on the Day of Judgment. I was in Abu Dhabi and a taxi driver said to me, and I'm done. I was in Abu Dhabi, a taxi driver said to me, I said, where are you from? He said, Dara'a. 
And I said to him, I hope that your family's safe. He said the house caved in on them. My father was killed. He said to me, I've worked 12 years. Every month I sent everything I could back to my father to build that house. And it was destroyed. I feel like my whole life is a waste. I said to him, Ya akhi, bil Arabiya, ihtasib and Allah. Wallahi kunta fi birrin bi walidayk. You were in filial piety to your parents. Believe in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you're doing is not to build in this world. Man bana li hadihi dunya faqad khaba ma bana. If you build for this world, what you build will go to naught. We build for the next world, not for this world. And if what we build, if, if my college in California is destroyed by an earthquake, so be it. So be it. But we are builders for the akhirah, and this is the place we do it. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum.